Welcome back to another edition of the Heart to Heart Podcast. My guest today is Dr. Joe Zondel. He's a cancer biologist. Welcome to the show, brother. Thanks for having me, Mike. I really appreciate it. So I really want to chat with you today. I kind of compare you to Lane Norton and out of the cancer world. So if you're not familiar with Lane Norton, he's, in my opinion, he's probably the top nutritionist there is in the world. He's very good at debunking claims and he's done that very well with nutrition. Uh, when I found uh, Dr. Joe's page, I kind of found like the same thing. It's just that instead of he was focusing more on uh, cancer and obviously less on nutrition, obviously there's a little bit of cancer that comes in with, you know, uh, with or sorry, nutrition that may play a role in preventing cancers and that kind of thing. Right. But, uh, you know, that's why I wanted to, to have you on here today. But before we just get started and before I fire some questions at you, uh, can you give the audience just a little bit of a brief background about yourself? Yeah. So I guess a little bit of a brief background. Again, thanks for having me and pretty high remarks uh, coming from being compared to, to Lane Norton. He's a good friend of mine, actually. Uh, we oh, talk wow. somewhat regularly. Um, but I really do appreciate that. But a little bit about my background. I, um, I guess I received my uh, undergraduate education actually in Florida at the um, at St. Leo University in biology, just biology. And, um, you know, through other personal reasons, um, we can talk about that a little bit um, today. Um, I, I, I realized I was very good at, at cancer biology and pursued a cancer biology track after undergrad. Um, I tried getting into the Moffitt Cancer Research Institute down in Tampa, Florida, just um, just outside of my undergrad institution, uh, was ultimately rejected um, and then received a, um, you know, after countless applications, um, received um, a call back from a technician position in a lab at Moffitt. Um, so I worked for many years as a technician and that lab eventually moved to um, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, where I ended up actually staying at the same institute where I was a technician at the Wistar Institute um, throughout graduate school. And that's where um, I received my graduate degree from the University of the Sciences in cancer biology. And so, yeah. Excellent. Yeah. So it's quite a bit of, uh, of you know, um, experience that you have, though, in the cancer field. I mean, it goes a lot of people, you know, they go from an undergrad, they jump to something else, doesn't necessarily, you know, correlate that much. But it seems like kind of like your whole um, you know, career in academics and what you're doing now kind of seems to all revolve around cancer, which is probably why you have the number one IG page <laughs> for cancer. Self-titled, yeah, self-announced. Self-titled, but definitely deserved, definitely deserved. So I guess we'll just kind of get started with, with some questions. So with regards to like, you know, preventing cancer, so I'm, you know, a pretty big fan of Dr. Atiyah's work. Um, you're probably familiar with him as well. And you know, I read his book on, on longevity and, you know, he mentioned like the best way to, you know, treat or prevent, uh, cancer is to get screened, you know, and, um, in terms of screening, you know, I guess we can break it up a little bit into, you know, males and, and females. Maybe we'll just start with males, but, you know, do you recommend guys getting, uh, say something like the PSA test? Um, earlier than say what's in the guidelines. Like some people will say 50, some people will say 40. Do you believe in the validity of that test or, and you know, how should people approach um, getting their PSAs? Yeah. I mean, there's, there's, again, there's a lot I don't know here from a screening perspective, um, but I will say in, in all regards, getting screened is going to reduce, uh, reduce risks for, for most cancer types, especially if you can detect a cancer early um, regarding PSA and prostate cancer. Um, I think anywhere from, you know, 30 years onward in males would be a good time to, you know, consider getting regular prostate exams and uh, potentially PSA uh, checks. Yeah, I, I agree with that, too. And, and the reason is, I've you know, maybe mentioned this before on the podcast, but, you know, it's the people who get cancer, prostate cancer specifically in their 30s, 40s, you know, early 50s. Those are the people that succumb to prostate cancer. You know, the people who get it later in life, they not all the time, but generally they actually die from something else. And, you know, depending on which oncologist you talk to or which guideline you, you look at, you know, some of them have even said to start at, you know, the PSA is at 50, which I think is ridiculous. Um, so, you know, I'm with you. I think that you should get it, you know, your first one done at 30. And then, you know, it's, it's a pretty cheap test in Canada. It's like $30, $34, or something like that. And maybe get that done every like, you know, two to three years starting at, um, at 30 years of age. And I think that would be, you know, a reasonable, 
approach. It's, you know, it's non-invasive. You're going to get blood work anyway, or you should be anyway. Um, so, you know, at least annually, but for a lot of different reasons, you may be doing it you know, more than annually. And so just getting another PSA test, I think is a very easy thing that guys could do to potentially, you know, prevent, you know, a very devastating cancer early on in their life. Well, I think, um, you know, and you bring up a good point regarding the fact that, you know, you're, are you in Canada right now? I'm in Canada. So, yeah. so I'm in the United States and the healthcare situation is a bit different in the United States. And so I think, I think even in most cases, in most countries, healthcare is a, is a privilege. So Absolutely. while it might be relatively cheap in say Canada, it, it can run up some costs here in the United States. So I think that socioeconomic status does play a role. And of course, I'm an advocate for preventative strategies or risk reduction strategies regarding screening. Um, some tests are more expensive than others. And I think prostate, uh, checks are, are relatively more affordable than most, but still they can, they can run up some costs here in the States, but it's, you know, it's a different discussion regarding healthcare. Yeah. Yeah. I guess the, the bottom line is, you know, if you can manage your best to maybe, you know, do some uh, prostate uh, cancer screening earlier on, like I think at the age of 30 to 35 is a very, very reasonable time frame, uh to, to start that. I don't think that's too early, you know, whatsoever. Yeah. Um, and again, to add a little bit of context here, you know, just because, 50 years of age is the suggested guideline. It is only a guideline um, that's based on standardized um, metrics from research. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that people have to, after the age of 50, start getting prostate checks and PSA tests done. They can definitely get that done sooner to be more, um, you know, in check with their their health. Yeah. And then, so, you know, moving on from uh, prostate, just trying to get into like the big killer. So, sure. you know, colorectal cancer uh, is another um, big killer. I actually had a pretty close friend, Elias, who actually died from that a couple of years I'm sorry ago. Sorry to hear that, man. So, yeah. So it's, uh, you know, something that's a little bit near and dear to me in some ways. But in terms of, um, you know, colorectal cancer screen, like some people say, uh, you know, 50, I think that's the guideline here in Canada right now. Peter Atia thinks, you know, you should start more at like 40 years of age. Um, and you seem to be nodding there. And I kind of agree with you. I think that, you know, maybe 40 years of age is the best place to start, even if you are like healthy, you know, like even if you are a healthy person, I think it's a reasonable thing to do. And I, I just think it's, you know, obviously the colonoscopy is a little or much more invasive than a PSA test, but still it's, it's, it's a great test. And, and also to, you know, it's one of the only tests where the only one I can think of, maybe you, um, can, can suggest there's another, but it's the only one I can think of where you can actually, uh, diagnose and treat like at the same time. So meaning like if you do cancer screening for a colonoscopy, uh, and they see a polyp, the surgeon can actually remove the polyp right there on the spot, which is pretty incredible. Yeah. And then the other part of that is that, you know, 100 is correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure 100% of colon cancers come from polyps. So essentially you can, if you always see the, the first few polyps developing uh, through a colonoscopy and you get that uh, particular treatment of removing the polyp, you can essentially you know, remove all uh, colorectal cancers if that if that w were how it played out. Yeah. Which obviously, it's not going to, but you know, theoretically, you could. Yeah, I mean, that's definitely going to depend on how good the surgeon is in terms of removing the polyp. Because yeah. you know, if obviously if the margins aren't removed carefully around the tumor, you're still going to be left with or around the polyp, you're still going to be left with uh, cells that could potentially become malignant. So, of course, there is some context behind the surgery there in terms of um, success, but. Yeah, I know. I think Peter, Atia, and I are in agreement on this that, um, you know, colorectal screening should be uh, probably within the age of 40 or so and onward. Um, and especially that's true because colon cancer rates are rising in younger people. Um, I was actually reading a study today that, that showed that cancer rates in, in regards to colon cancer are rising in younger people. So that uh, kind of supports the notion that colorectal screening, uh, colorectal cancer screening should be done. Um, you know, anywhere from 35 to 40 years old as well. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I fully agree with you on that. And I think a lot of people that are listening probably, you know, agree with that as well, yeah. because that does seem to be, as you just alluded to what, you know, a lot of the, the research says. Um, and if you are going to prevent and screen, then you should prevent and screen early. That's the whole point is preventing and screen before it, it, it becomes a cancer. Um, 
Okay, so we've kind of covered colorectal and prostate. Uh, the other two that I wanted to cover were were lung and, and breast. Um, so, you know, lung in terms of uh, prevention. So lung, we know, obviously, is highly correlated to smoking cigarettes. Um, you know, you can develop uh, lung cancer without smoking cigarettes, but that certainly is you know, one of the main uh, ways where people do get cancer. So if you are, do you have different approaches, say, if someone is, a cigarette smoker versus a non-cigarette smoker in terms of, you know, preventing uh, cancers? Like, would you recommend that if you're a smoker, um, obviously you're going to recommend they stop smoking, but right. <laughs> if they're a smoker, would you recommend them getting, you know, say an X-ray at the age of 35, like a chest X-ray or what are your sort of thoughts on that? I mean, there are many risks in our environment associated with, um, with lung cancer. Um, so yes, of course, cigarette smoke is, is one thing, but of, of course, like things like radon exposure, uh, radioactive decay from radon, um, can trap little particles in the lungs and induce malignant transformation, AKA lung cancer as well. Um, so those are certain things that people need to pay attention to as well. Um, obviously, you know, not smoking is going to reduce risks dramatically, um, yeah. for lung cancer. Um, but also people who live in you know, cities or relatively polluted areas are going to be more at risk. So in those situations, you can't exactly control those pollutants because they're, they're the entirety of your environment. But what I would say to those people is there are a number of other things that you can do to reduce risks if you're unable to change your, your current environment. Um, and that honestly, all of that begins with exercise, um, paying attention to sleep habits, you know, controlling the controllables, as I often say. Um, which are things people already know in terms of risk reduction strategies, you know, having consistent sleep schedules, um, eating a nutritious diet. Um, and by nutritious, I mean, you know, omnivorous, the way that humans have evolved to eat various foods, you know, consuming a lot of vegetables, fiber, you know, these things are going to reduce not only lung cancer risks, um, but also things like colorectal cancer risks as well, because there's associations between, um, microbial diversity and, um, and health outcomes as well. Um, and that is also true regarding lungs as well. And just to note on the, uh, fruits and vegetables, or maybe I'm mixing that, maybe it's, it's only vegetables, but from my understanding, it's, you should get about five, about up to five servings seems to have a preventative effect. And then after that, it's not that there's no effect. It's just that it kind of diminishes off. Is that the amount that you recommend for people in terms of again i know preventing cancer is a odd um word to use and i know they're laughing because i saw that video that you did be, you know you said like preventing cancer can be triggering for people because it's like oh if you did this you would have you know not had cancer that's not what we're saying we're just saying there's certain strategies that can reduce your risk so you know maybe not completely prevent but re reduce your, your risk um, yeah, so I would so generally term, suggest that in terms of um, in terms of fruit and vegetable consumption, five servings a day is again the general guideline, and honestly, it's a it's a good guideline in my opinion. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And I actually, I said that on Gabrielle Lyons' podcast because I do often get this question, often about you know how I can prevent cancer, um, and that's why I've rephrased what I've said to to focus on reducing people's risk because I did have cancer patients reaching out to me a little bit upset, like you know. Um, because there's a lot of stigma around the associations between the word of prevention. So that's why I've, I've switched my wording a little bit to be more, I guess, conscious of the, the things that people can actually do. And, and I don't want them to think that if I exercise, if I eat the perfect diet, perfect quote unquote um, diet, I'm not going to get cancer. If I get the perfect sleep schedule, I'm not going to get cancer. But you can still get cancer even if you've quote unquote optimized your, life spot, your lifestyle to um, be anti-cancerous. So I, I just try and give people realistic considerations that even in the off chance that they do all of the things that I suggest for risk reduction strategies and they do get cancer, they can rest relatively easy at the end of the day, knowing they did what they could. In terms of fruits and vegetables and greens powders, and I know that we have a couple friends that kind of like to make fun of greens powders, particularly uh, Adrian Chavez. I call him a friend. I've only had my podcast He's a good dude. Once, I like him. I don't, I don't really know uh, Adrian that well, but I guess maybe more of um, an acquaintance. But in terms of uh, greens, like, do you think that that plays into um, the role of preventing cancer? Like, can that be counted as, you know, a couple servings? I know this is probably a very difficult um, question to answer, and maybe the 
you know, the, the literature hasn't really teased this out yet, but you know, if someone has, they have a day where they only have one or two servings and then they have a scoop of, you know, let's just say it's AG1 or whatever greens product that they're using, you know, will that qualify up to, up to four to five servings or how do you kind of work that approach? Yeah. So honestly, if it, I think greens powders can be useful. And I think Adrian would agree in this too, in that, um, you know, if somebody can't consume or doesn't consume a certain amount of vegetables per day that maybe they're comfortable with, um, specifically regarding even like fiber consumption, we can talk about that shortly. Yes. But um, greens powders um, can be a useful tool to anyone's tool belt to supplement for potential, um, you know, micronutrients that that maybe they didn't get by the end of the day, and they just wanted to you know, drink a scoop or two of, uh, of something like AG1 or other greens powders that are out there just to get, you know, the vitamins that it would have typically gotten had they, you know, had that extra serving of, of vegetables, but no one wants to, you know, go eat a few leaves of kale right before they're about to go to bed. It's a lot easier to drink, uh, some form of <laughs> greens powder. So, you know, I guess yeah. it comes with knowing the limitations and also respecting your time in terms of um, getting appropriate vegetable and fruit consumption. Yeah. So I think in general, it's best to get it from real food, Absolutely. whole foods, and then if there is a day where, you know, you can't get it in and you take your greens powder, maybe it's, you know, getting you up to the a lot at serving of five. Maybe it's not, but it's probably doing something rather than rather than nothing. And it doesn't seem like it's going to hurt. Right. And the same thing could be said about things like protein powders as well. Right. So, like, obviously, of course, you should try and get as much of your nutrition from whole food sources. But if you can't by the end of the day, let's say you're on a macronutrient goal um, and you're trying to increase your protein intake. Um, you don't have either enough calories left if you're on a particular diet or you, you're not really that hungry. It's a lot easier to, you know, get your macronutrient intake if you consume a protein powder at the end of the day through, you know, any standard whey isolate protein powder. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I'm, I'm 200 pounds, so I try to eat 200 grams of protein a day. It's, it's tough. Not easy. Yeah, same here. Right? So, yeah. so I, I, you know, there's days where I usually depend upon two scoops probably. And then, you know, sometimes even three. And then I do try to overall eat just like a moderate or low saturated fat diet in some ways. But I do have, you know, eggs every day. And, uh, in terms of, um, you know, using or sorry, eating eggs, like they are, you know, a fairly low cal calorie ish food if you're just eating them alone, but it's still like, you know, there's people think, oh, eggs, protein. There's, if you have four eggs, it's only like 25, like maybe 28 grams of protein. If they're huge, like it's not that much. That means like at 200 pounds, you have like 28 grams. It's like, I still need another 172. Yeah. I mean, that's a lot. You know, it stands to reason that you don't, you also don't need to just consume eggs to get protein source in that particular context too. But, it, you know, it's also important to note that, you know, there are other good things inside eggs that people can eat, like choline as well, that, that help with other bodily functions um, or even reducing risk for things like neurodegeneration, which uh, my friend Max Lugavere has spoken about. Uh, pretty frequently on his channel, he loves his eggs. You know, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I've seen, I've yeah. seen Max post a lot about eggs. Yeah. He's a great. He's I've never met him. Avid before, egg supporter. <laughs> he seems like a great guy. Yeah, he's cool. Um, in terms of other sort of like uh, micronutrients, I know you've talked uh, a lot about fiber, and um, Lane talks a lot about fiber, and he's probably the one who got me really onto it, and. Uh, Kevin Bass, who I've had on here uh, a couple times as well, has talked a lot about it. There was that meta-analysis study. You probably know what I'm going to be talking about that said, like, for every 10 grams of fiber you eat, your overall mortality decreases by 10%. Mm -hmm. I don't know why they didn't do it, just like one gram for 1% instead of 10 for 10. But um, Scientists like to make things bigger than they are sometimes just to make like the – or drive the point home. Yeah. Yeah. So that was, that was a very interesting study, good study. And, and, you know, when Lane, uh, I forget what podcast he's on, they were talking about longevity and said, well, if you're going to talk about longevity, you got to talk about fiber, you know, and in terms of fiber. So the type that I generally take is, is psyllium husk. And the reason why I take that type of fiber is it's the one, as far as I know, it's been most specific for lowering um, cholesterol. And so, you know, I do have a little bit of heart disease in my family, unfortunately, not like crazy, but a little bit. So I do try to, you know, keep my LDL, you know, a little bit low. Um, but in terms of, of fiber, um, is there a particular kind, like whether it's like 
inulin, which is, you know, seems to be this, you know, hot prebiotic fiber that a lot of people are into, or, you know, psyllium husk, which I just mentioned. And then also too, there's just, you know, different fibers in obviously foods. So in terms of like if someone's trying to, again, reduce the risk, not prevent, reduce the risk Thank of, you. of cancer. Uh, and I'm going to use that now for, for Good. From now on. I'm never going to forget You're going to increase your traction um, for it. I hope so. So in terms of the, uh, the fiber, is there a specific kind that is helpful for cancer? Just say like we think psyllium husk is more specific for lowering LDL for, for heart disease. So I think when we talk about fiber, it's very important to, to understand that there are many different types of fiber, like you mentioned inulin before, but also to understand their, their chemical properties um, or even their metabolic properties. So there's, there's differences between fiber in that they can be fermented and non-fermented when they um, hit the intestinal tract. So if um, you have somebody with like irritable bowel disease, maybe you want to um, give them some sort of non-fermentable, um, insoluble uh, fiber source to help with their, their gut health. You don't want to promote uh, inflammation, which can lead to gas production in the gut of somebody who has irritable bowel disease or, or some form of uh, bowel syndrome. So again, it's important to pay attention to the chemical properties. You mentioned psyllium husk. Psyllium husk is a non-fermentable, insoluble fiber source. Um, and it's something that I utilize often uh, via Metamucil. The brand of Metamucil is psyllium husk fiber source. Um, it's something that I utilize in my diet because I have some intestinal uh, health issues. And, and, you know, maybe this is TMI, but I get pretty bad gas. Um, yeah, so do I. We actually had to, we had to switch duvets. So I no longer have a queen size duvet. My fiance made us get two twin duvets. Okay. So that's how we're sleeping nice. now. So well, I'm with you on, on the gas. Yeah. Just thought I'd, now you I'd can, throw that in You there. can Dutch oven yourself. Um, <laughs> maybe that's TMI again for the uh, the channel. But, you know, again, getting back to the, the importance of fiber. Um, regarding the research, of course, outside of that meta-analysis, we also see that fiber is incredibly important for um, increasing the likelihoods of patient outcomes to therapy as well. So um, there have been a few studies um, now that show that those who consume more fiber that are cancer patients, um, particularly colorectal cancer patients, um, and even melanoma cancer patients, they will respond better to specific types of therapies called immunotherapies if their fiber intake is, is higher. Um, and obviously, the mechanistic implications there are, are kind of diverse, um, and there are a few things uh, that they determine in the literature, um, but we won't necessarily get into the actual mechanisms there because I don't think it's important. But the overall message there is that fiber is not only healthy or helpful for, for healthy people, but it's also important for cancer patients and can actually increase their responsiveness to therapies, which can save their life. That's insane, actually. Yeah, I'll have to send that's you those insane. studies offline. It's pretty cool. Yeah, like I, I do want to ask you a little bit about LDL in a second, too, but just on that too, just because we're kind of talking about um, macro and micronutrients that can, uh, you know, reduce the risk of, of cancer. In terms of vitamin D, is it just that it is helpful at uh, preventing metastasis or can it also potentially, um, you know, reduce your original risk of acquiring a cancer? If, and maybe it does even have uh, evidence to say that it reduces your risk of metastases. But from some of the um, literature I've seen, I've, I've seen some good literature indicating that it can reduce risk of metastases, but I haven't seen like any really hard literature that says that it may be able to prevent it in the first place. But please correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong. So here's the thing is like, there's only so much that I can read in a day um, between my, yeah. my full, uh, full work schedule, as well as, you know, the things I do on social media. So actually I don't know of any studies um, that, that show that vitamin D can reduce metastasis um, in, in specific cancers. So if you know of something, please send it to me. I'd, I'd be happy to take a look and get back to you on that. Um, but I don't want to give potentially wrong information off of an assumption. Um, from what, again, I can assume, you know, obviously vitamin D is very healthy for healthy people. I don't know the context of what it'll do in a cancer patient. I think a good example of that is actually, I made a reel a long time ago. Um, there's, you know, obviously there's these mechanistic studies that show that certain supplements or, or vitamins can cause specific cancer outcomes. But we honestly, we don't know how those things will translate into larger patient data sets. Um, so a good example is, you know, I was reading a study that showed that creatine can promote metastasis in relatively late stage breast cancer patients. 
Um, they had some elaborate models and some patient, some very weak patient data to support those outcomes. And they had some mechanisms in the paper. But a lot of people will read a paper like that and say, oh, breast cancer patients shouldn't be taking creatine. But I argue that sometimes um, the effects of supplementation in some cases, or even like creatine, are actually beneficial for cancer patients because of um, other outcomes that might um, oh, like outweigh the potential risks of metastasis. So like in the context of creatine, cancer patients will often have uh, increased muscle loss as they progress in their disease. So if they're utilizing creatine to, you know, help in their workouts, maybe promote endurance and help build muscle mass, it's going to have significantly greater effects on their, their overall disease outcomes, um, compared to, you know, not taking creatine and potential risks of metastasis. Yeah. I don't want to jump too far off the, the topic of cancer, right. but just creatine in general is, it is a pretty incredible supplement. Like the benefits you get for the risks are amazing. And, you know, it's been shown that it's not just necessarily, you know, good for getting an extra rep in the gym, but <laughs> it also has other like many beneficial effects that can actually help with cognition in, mm -hmm. in elderly people. It's even been shown to be uh, effective as an adjunct to antidepressants um, in some ways like um, SAMe can and, and some of these other molecules. So, um, yeah, I mean, I almost, you know, want to say that it should be almost universally like prescribed for people in, you know, their 60s, just because it may be something that could help prevent muscle loss. And as we know, you know, and as you just said, <clears throat> muscle loss happens very, very quickly, you know, when once you get into the later decades. And one of the big things that uh, you can do is take creatine and that can, you know, potentially help prevent that muscle loss and also some of that cognitive decline. But well, definitely reduce the rate of uh, muscle loss there. But that's, you know, it's it's a very very good to point out the importance of creatine for, I guess, for both of our audiences. Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. So I'm glad you, you brought that up. I did want to circle back though yeah. to cancer and LDL. Mm -hmm. So as I just mentioned, you know, I take a little bit of uh, psyllium husk to reduce my LDL. All the people that I sort of, um, you know, really um, think are credible online, like someone like um, Lane Norton, uh, Kyle Gillette, Kevin Bass, uh, Peter Atia, like these guys are all into lowering LDL. And it just seems that like, I just can't imagine a world where all those guys are wrong just because it seems like they're all pretty credible people. Um, the, the reason why I bring, bring up LDL is not because of heart disease, but some people believe that high LDL is actually protective against cancer. Low LDL is not so protective against cancer. Um, any thoughts on that and what do you, what's your sort of approach with LDL and cancer? Again, I haven't, I haven't dug into the research regarding LDL, um, especially. So you said high LDL is associated with reduced risks for cancer. I've seen some like epidemiological studies that have shown that I don't know for sure if that's, you know, accurate information. And like I said, I'm certainly not applying that to my life right now. I am still, you know, um, trying to lower LDL, uh, despite the fact that I know this information. Yeah. So, I mean, from a, from a cancer perspective, I would have expected, um, you know, lower LDL to be associated with reduced risks of, of cancers. So I'm sure that there are some contexts from the epidemiological research that, that we could stratify to better understand how LDL is playing a role. Um, but if they did find a specific trend, and you'll have to send me this paper because I, I was unfamiliar with it. Um, if they did find this trend that um, I'd be willing to argue it's relatively inaccurate, that we need more patient data to make any any strong conclusive uh, claims from from that sort of data. Does that make okay. sense? I'm 100%. And I'm looking forward to, to sending you that, that paper. Sure. Um, Thanks, man. Just because uh, it would... Um you know, just provide a little bit of context, I guess, for, for people. Yeah. Again, I, it's important that people know I can't read everything. So like, as much as I try and stay up on the literature, there's some things I got to, you know, focus on and, and it's okay to say, I don't know to something. So. Yeah, no, I have to say it to, you know, some patients too, like they, like someone asked me about, you know, methylene blue the other day, and I know it's something, I know it's online, but to be honest, I still don't know anything about it. Like I can't know about every single supplement and I have to know about drugs too. Right. So like, so I have to know all about the, the drugs as well. 
Um, so yeah, it's, it's a lot like no one knows about every single supplement or every single behavioral strategy, you know, like even if you're someone like Andrew Huberman, who that's who, all he does all day, there's going to be some things that, you know, he gets wrong or some things yeah, that no one's you know, perfect. Misses. It's yeah. It's, uh, it's just something that, that, that kind of happens. Um, in terms of, uh, inflammation, this is something that I wanted to chat with you about. Cause I know that you had a, a post on it there fairly um, recently. And, you know, people are always saying like, you know, lower inflammation, lower inflammation, lower inflammation. And the way that I test inflammation for patients, it's only really one test that I do for the most part is a CRP or a C-reactive protein. You know, sometimes you can order an ESR and, and some other things as well, but essentially what most people focus on for inflammation is, is a C-reactive protein. And I have seen at least, you know, one study, I'm not saying that this is going to be definitely replicated, but it's shown that it's, you know, maybe uh, as much of a risk factor for heart disease than LDL. Again, that's a massive statement. That was just one study, but, you know, something, you know, definitely to look into. But in terms of inflammation, can you lower it too much? Like, is there a way where, you know, you, 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 you would actually are making, uh, you know, detrimental effects to the body because you're lowering inflammation too much. So the, the short, simple answer to that is, is yes. Um, and I think a lot of this stems from the fact that when we say inflammation, it's a blanket term for extremely complex processes in the, in the body regarding, um, how our immune cells not only work together in fighting off pathogens, but also repairing damage in the body. And so inflammatory responses due to all of these immune cells are going to vary between tissues in the body. Nonetheless, it's going to vary dramatically in disease states as well. So when we, when we say, you know, that we want to lower inflammation, it has, again, it has very specific context where you'd want to lower inflammation. You never in the, the course of your life, you, you never want zero inflammatory response in your body because that would mean your immune system is not working. And we have evidence of that, you know, people who have autoimmune disorders, um, where eventually over time, their immune system stops working in a particular way. It's hyperactivated in other ways, but it stops working in other ways. Would they then have like no C-reactive protein in that case? Um, I think focusing on, on C-reactive protein would be um, looking at it through a very small lens. Um, okay. I don't realistically, I don't know how CRP levels would change. I don't, you know, I have to admit again, I'm not an immunologist. But the, the immunology that I have taken, the advanced immunology courses, and, and of course, through hands-on research, you know, examining inflammatory markers associated with tumors and stuff like that, um, you know, I think it's, people, it's important that people understand that these responses are diverse and there are contexts where we're going to want to lower inflammation, but there are also contexts where we're going to want to increase inflammation. And that's that increasing inflammation component is actually where immunotherapies work. So if I can bring this to cancer a little bit, um, in cancers, oftentimes in the environment surrounding a tumor, they're actually very immunosuppressive. So they will, cancer cells will hide from the immune system. They don't want to be recognized because then if they were recognized, they would be eradicated by the immune system. So especially if they're detecting abnormalities. So one way that we can try and have a therapy for those specific cancers is by using an immunotherapy to bring immune, uh, immune cells into the tumor um, to enable them to recognize specific things about the cancer cells that enable the immune system to target them. So that's technically increasing inflammation into the cancer. So you want to guide the inflammatory response to specific areas to have helpful outcomes. Okay. Amazing. And the drugs work in that way and that the drugs will actually increase inflammation and that can be the mechanism by which it can suppress the cancer. Yes. In a very simplistic okay. manner. Okay. Yeah. Very, very interesting because you always, always hear people say, you know, lower inflammation, lower inflammation as much as you can. And I was kind of surprised actually, I went on, um, you're probably familiar with examine.com. So I went on there pretty recently and then they had, uh, which I thought was surprising, I really had no idea, they had boron as the top supplement to lower CRP. And then they had curcumin, I think, as number two. But then they had curcumin as the top one to lower inflammation. So that kind of got me a little bit confused. And then to add all to the confusion, uh, you know, Huberman's kind of said that 
Um, if you take curcumin, it can lower your DHT, which may in fact, you know, be, can be beneficial for some people, mm -hmm. especially if you're looking to, you know, keep all your hair or not right. your prostate grow, but it can be detrimental, I guess, if you're, you know, trying to feel your best well-being, good, you know, uh, energy, sex drive, all that kind of stuff that comes with testosterone DHT. So there is a little bit of a, um, you know, of a, of a balance there. But it was kind of interesting how they had boron and then curcumin because, as you probably know, you know there was at least one human study done on boron showing that when you take that, it will decrease your SHBG, which can increase your free testosterone, whereas curcumin can have the opposite effect. Okay, and then that's interesting. When Huber and then when Huberman uh, mentioned that, I was like, oh god damn! Like, what am I going to use now for for pain? Because there's not too many supplements that have good evidence. Um, so I looked up uh, Boswellia. I think I'm saying that right. I don't even know if I am. And um, that actually uh, had the same uh, mechanism as curcumin. Like, sure, it was shown to lower inflammation, lower pain, but it also lowered DHT, which was kind of odd. So it seems like you know boron is the i guess bro anti-inflammatory <laughs> because it's gonna increase your t you know compared to the others i mean that's um, that's super interesting data and i've i've seen similar studies that show the efficacies of, of boron in in you know decreasing inflammation um but i think again <clears throat> going back to inflammation one of the important things that i think people need to understand is you know there's a there's a difference between acute inflammation and chronic inflammation and acute inflammation most of the time is is not going to lead to any sort of negative health outcomes. It's the chronic inflammation that we want to lower. So we can't have this blanket statement of saying, oh, we just want to lower inflammation. It's specifically chronic unresolved inflammation. Our whole job of our immune system is to resolve that inflammation as quickly as possible and just have you know baseline inflammation just to deal with standard tissue repair and those sorts of things. But if it becomes too much to handle, that's when we have bad outcomes in the clinic. And then if you, I believe so too, if you were to injure yourself, and again, I'm, I'm saying this, I'm saying I'm not 100% sure at the same, but I'm pretty sure if you were to injure yourself, like just, you know, you, you sprained your ankle or something like that, and then you did some, some kind of test, like your CRP may in fact be elevated just from all that inflammation from that injury. But it, it doesn't mean that, you know, you need to lower inflammation in that particular um, instance, because obviously your body is doing that to protect you. It's doing it to, you know, put, um, you know, nutrients there around the area so it can, so it can heal and recover. Yeah. And I think people also need to understand that that inflammatory response due to damage or some microbe or something like that is literally your immune cells secreting proteins to tell other immune cells, Hey, we've got a problem here. I need an army to fix this shithole that's going on. So um, you know, excuse my language, but that's essentially what, uh, you know, what Don't inflammation is. All, it's welcome. <laughs> yeah. Um, so there was a couple more things that I wanted to, to ask about sort of, I guess, trendy social media things that I think would be good for you to debunk maybe in, in, in some particular way. So, um, one thing is about the cell phones and headphones and EMF radiation, um, so yeah, you got your headphones on there right now. So, I mean, can you just let people know that or let people know what the research says, uh, regarding that and let people know if they have to have any kind of worry at all about that? Yeah. I mean, there's, there's natural worry that comes with utilizing, um, anything that is going to emit electromagnetic frequencies, things that we can't see. Um, it's not radiation. Hopefully there's no radioactive decaying isotopes in your headphones if you did you got a bad pair of headphones um or computer if that's the case too um but i can say with you know some degree of confidence relatively strong degree of confidence that the likelihood of your headphones bluetooth emf or you know emfs coming from computers or, or various other electronics like your phone um they're not high enough energy to be able to damage your cells or even penetrate into your skull um you know, there's, there's a lot of variation between magnetic fields and radiation. So again, the research remains to be determined on whether or not those magnetic fields can alter things within cells. But I would, I would argue that again, there's such weak levels that, um, even over time under chronic exposure to, you know, EMFs from headphones or your phone, I would argue that the health effects would be minimal, even if, if over time, again, that's assuming you've got a decent 
um, decent cell phone and decent computer and decent electronics. Okay. So for the most part, it's not something that anybody really has to worry no, about going forward. I don't, I have, I have them on my head and I have my cell phone right here. We're talking, you know, via microphone and computer right now. Okay. I love it. So that's good. Um, another thing, do you think that the best anti-aging cream would be sunscreen? The best anti-aging cream would be sunscreen. This is a, this is what Kevin uh, Bass has, has said to me before. And I'm just wondering if you agree with that. I mean, he's probably being a little bit, you know, facetious there, but you know, he's kind of posted some pictures online. You've probably seen him of like, you know, uh, a driver, for example, who has like his arm out the window, mm -hmm. his whole life or the, like the face kind of to the side of the window. And then that, you know, has, uh, yeah, it's like, aged, <laughs> yeah, you know, I've seen it yeah. the side that's not. And so, you know, that's kind of, I guess the, 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 the thought uh, process behind him making that particular statement. I'm not saying that there's no, no anti-aging creams out there that don't work or anything like that. No, just absolutely. Sort of, you know, um, just kind of, what are your thoughts on, sure. on sunscreen? Sure. So, um, I would say it's not the best anti-aging cream. It's the best cream just to protect your skin. There are some yeah. aging creams or anti-aging creams that, um, you know, help to, you know, form decent collagen matrices in the skin and, um, in general, just promote good skin health, hydration and those sorts of things. Um, and I, I follow some people, um, Olina Belay, uh, skin queen as she goes, um, on, on Instagram is, uh, Olina Belay. You can follow her in your, in your free time. She would know more about this than I do, especially regarding things like retinoic acid for, for de-risking skin aging. So I moving my cat here. Um, but, you know, going back to sunscreen, I would say, again, it's, it's important to integrate sunscreen with other skin protecting or health promoting um, creams for your skin regarding hydration. Uh, you know, obviously sunscreen as its intended purpose goes is to reduce the ability of ultraviolet radiation to penetrate the skin and damage your cells, which over time can be cancer causing. Um, so I'm in, I'm an avid supporter of utilizing sunscreen, especially under prolonged sun exposure. Okay. And in terms of the type of sunscreen, like, do you think that there's a lot of products on the market that, you know, do have potentially some cancer causing products in them? And would you, you know, stick more to, I think most people now are using a, a lot of, um, uh, zinc micro, am I saying micronide oxide zinc, I think is the ingredient. And then the way that that you know, works is essentially, I mean, it's terrible to put on. It's just like a white cream. It's almost just putting on like clothes, like on your, on your skin. Like yeah. It's, it's a bit like, insoluble. It's literally just creating a barrier. Yeah. Right. So, um, it's not, it's not, uh, you know, that aesthetic to like put on, but is that, you know, what, what, I guess, what type of sunscreen would you wear? Say if you, you know, were going on a, on a beach for, on a beach vacation. Yeah, no, that's a good question. I would use the, the standard SPF 30 plus that you can buy at the store. I don't, you know, again, I don't, I think this comes with a cost or a risks to benefits ratio. Um, you know, we can sit there and hyper fixate on zinc oxalates or, or various things within or zinc micro, essentially micro crystals, um, within, um, sunscreens. But at the end of the day, the, the, the benefit to risk ratio is going to be in your favor. If you wear sunscreen in terms of reducing risks for cancer, instead of hyper fixating on those, those small little particles in there. Um, hopefully you shouldn't be using, you know, a sunscreen at a frequency where those things are going to impact your health, but you would need again, and I say this all the time, just as Lane does, the dose makes the poison. You shouldn't be using that much sunscreen where, I mean, you'd have to literally bathe in it to get some sort of negative health effects that, um, you know, we typically show in the literature. I think it's also important to note that oftentimes in the literature, we exacerbate things or make things worse to see if, you know, really high doses of something can exhibit an outcome that we're looking for. And oftentimes when you give an absolute shit ton of a dose of a compound, like things that we see in sunscreens or even in cereal preservatives or, you know, name any compound you want um, that's essentially on the food babes uh, yes. page, um, you know, you give high doses of any of those things, they're going to cause any disease. Yeah. So again, sunscreen's good for you. Use it when you have, you know, when you go outside under prolonged sun exposure, it reduces risks for UV to get into cells and damage you and potentially, you know, increase risks for things like melanoma. And I think that's a good segue to, to aspartame or, or diet Coke. So <laughs> is it a good know, segue? You want to watch my blood pressure go through the roof? 
go a little bit. So in terms of, you know, aspartame, there's, you know, a lot of people are trying to avoid it. But as you said, the dose makes the poison. Um, and like we've talked about Lane today, there was this genotoxic study that came out, I think sometime in the summer, I believe, something like that. And everyone jumped all over it. And then Lane kind of did his own breakdown, which he always does, which I love and appreciate. And then he says, I know, I don't know, remember the exact amount, but they were giving them like a thousand times. I'm just kind of making up that number, like the dose that, you know, you would get in, in a diet Coke. And, you know, I will admit, like I do still mostly drink um, Zevia just because I'm a little bit of a uh, a fan of that. Like I, I drink one or two a day. It's kind of like my, my, my vice, I guess. But at the same time, like if I'm out somewhere and, you know, someone makes me a cocktail and I will ask you about alcohol in a sec and it's made with diet Coke, like I don't care at all. Like I, I know that it's, you know, not going to, you know, affect me because the dose is that do cause, you know, delirious effects and rats and all these other uh, studies. It's just copious, copious amounts. It's the dose that makes the poison. And, you know, probably the best example of that would actually be Botox because, you know, every single woman is willing to get Botox, which is literally a toxin. But again, if you just, I'm not, you know, telling people to get Botox, my fiance doesn't get Botox. Again, Botox, like, you need a good surgeon yeah. to be able to administer Botox safely. Just because it's a toxin doesn't mean that it's going to, um, you know, kill you. But there have been cases when there's been, you know, people dying from getting Botox. Yeah, but, you, you got you to be careful. Yeah. I mean, it is, it, is, it is a big toxin, you know, so um, you have to be careful with it. Yeah, um, but going back to aspartame, you know, in, in going back yeah. to, you know, things that Lane has said, you know, I'm in agreement that the dose makes the poison there. And of course that, um, you know, when we look at the research, it shows that, you know, very high doses of aspartame um, have been shown to be associated with certain types of cancers um, or even non-nutritive sweeteners, I guess, or artificial sweeteners. Um, but again, I think people are missing the mark. Um, you know, Coke Zero, I love Coke Zero. Um, but it's important to consider the fact that, you know, yes, if I'm drinking so much Coke Zero that I'm going to have problems, um, realistically, I'm going to have other problems in my diet. And it's not just the Coke Zero or the aspartame consumption. It's going to be my lack of uh, nutritive uh, considerations to other foods. Um, so I think people need to consider that, you know, obviously regarding aspartame diet is a holistic thing. We need to consider all the things we're putting in our bodies and, and hopefully it's not just aspartame. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't want to get on the bandwagon that like, you know, you should be on the diet Coke diet. Right. All I'm saying is like, if you have a diet Coke once a week or so, you know, I don't think that's anything to, to, to worry about. Sure. So you've probably been asked this question before. People have asked me, microwaves has been like something that people have brought up with being associated with cancer since i was like a little kid you know people are saying like you know don't stand in front of the microwave it's gonna give you cancer you know like i i think i heard people say that when i was less than 10 years old yeah me too um so <laughs> there you go and i think probably most people listening to this have so yeah. you know what's the deal with microwaves because they're Super, super convenient. Like when I want to, you know, heat up something that I cooked last night, the next day, I use a microwave. And I will say, you know, I am a microwave user because of that. Um, you know, am I doing something wrong? Should I be worried about it? I use a microwave. Um, you know, going back, I think, um, you know, so as, as part of my education, we have to learn about the electromagnetic spectrum. And, and in this, you learn about, you know, how different wavelengths of energy vary between each other. So you have, you know, x-rays at one end of the spectrum with gamma rays, um, or even, you know, yeah, x-rays and gamma rays at one spectrum, you have infrared light at the other. Um, and again, you know, below visible light wavelengths of, of light, you have things like microwaves. Um, but if we look at the actual ability of these, these microwaves to, um, not only damage tissue, but also penetrate human tissue is, is slim to none because they're just, they're not operating basically at a frequency to be able to get through your skin. So if they're getting through your microwave's door, you've bought a defective microwave. So I can say with a strong degree of certainty, unless you've got a, a microwave that's been recalled um, because they put a bad door on it, um, it's safe to stand in front of a microwave. Um, and again, I think the, the, it's a complicated lesson to understand how different particles like microwaves move through space. 
Um, and that gets increasingly more complicated when we start to, to delve into radiation. Actually, I work at a company now that um, utilizes radiation to kill cancer um, through targeted therapies. So trust me, it gets even more complicated as you delve into the quantum physics realm um, and you start dealing with like radioactive decay. But, you know, again, microwaves don't operate at such a high level of energy to to get through your skin or even damaged tissue for that matter. And they actually work in a microwave by interacting with water atoms. So they interact with the nuclei and water atoms um, and cause vibrational friction. And that friction is what heats up the food. So if you're if you're trying to heat up a food that doesn't have that much water in it, it's not going to heat up very well. You've probably seen that. Or, you know, you'll see certain areas within like a hot pocket is a good example. It gets blazing hot um, yeah. because there's there's a decent amount of, of hydration in the in the in the hot pocket. Interesting. I never I never knew that, but uh, it totally makes sense. So, yeah. so people uh, could just Google yeah. this and they would solve all of their problems. But instead, they'd rather Google. <laughs> You know, can I stand in front of a microwave and get some garbage article that pops up on Google instead of the real information? Well, appreciate you you clarifying that um, because a lot of people, like I said, we both you know were told this you know when we were ten years old or younger you know don't stand in front of the microwave. Dude, I believe really that. I think I believed that probably even through undergrad until I started learning. You know, when you take those physics classes, you start learning about this stuff, and you're like, oh, okay, so that doesn't make any sense anymore. Yeah. That's why it's important to get an education. Yeah, and that's why it's important to have people like you and, and Lane and some of the people that we've mentioned on the podcast. I appreciate for, it, man. For clearing this stuff up. It's, it's, it's two-way awesome. street. Um, are there any kind of like unknowns that are legit risks that people you know, like may be exposed to that um, that they don't know of? Or is or do you think that if there was, like we'd kind of all know about it? What do you mean, unknown risks? Like, I guess, like, is there something that I could be doing in my life, like a common thing that most people would be exposed to, or most people that do, like maybe when they go to a certain place or something that, uh, th like, for example, like, you know, we just debunked the headphones and the, and the EMF, but is there anything that's actually legitimate out there or do people not generally accumulate too much radiation if they're just living like quote unquote a normal life. I mean, they shouldn't be if they, you know, if they've had their houses inspected, um, things like radon, like I said, linked to lung cancer, that'll actually build up in, in basements of houses. So before you buy a house, you should get, uh, some form of radon inspection, uh, to ensure that radiation levels are low in your house. You're going to have probably some background levels of radiation, uh, due to radon just because it's, you know, present in the atmosphere. Um, but regarding things that are unknown, we know most things that are associated with risks for cancers. Um, I would say, you know, even considering my own recent jump into um, the biotech industry in terms of um, my research, um, I will say that lately I've noticed I've become a lot more sedentary. I would say that people don't realize that, you know, becoming more sedentary is is tightly linked to not even just cancers, but, you know, cardiovascular disease as well. Um, so I would say that, you know, I want to put an emphasis on, on leading a sedentary lifestyle is something people want to avoid at all costs, especially if they, you know, care about their longevity. Yeah, because I mean, I, I'm going to quote Peter Atia here. Um, I think he says that if you're in the top two and a half percentile of your VO2 max, then you have like a 400% reduction in all cause mortality, which seems kind of insane, but um, because that's a crazy number. Because correct me if I'm wrong, but I think even something like smoking, like a 20 year pack history of smoking, I think only I'm saying only only increases your risk of cancer by like 40 percent or something like that. And so, if you have you know, uh, something you can do a behavioral change, like in and again, it's not easy to be in the top two and a half percent of your VO2 max, but if you can get there, like. Man, that's that. It seems like it's um like it's a gigantic reduction. Yeah. So I think it's again, this is this the important part about scientific um, data interpretations. We all need to understand that oftentimes when scientists write papers, it's with the intent to get published in journals. Um, so oftentimes we we make data sound more fancy than it than it actually is. So you know, in regards to you know that statistic that Peter T is mentioning, uh, realistically, that's a very small percentage probably of the population. And, I, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, that's most likely a, a small percentage of the population that is able to achieve that VO2 threshold to be able to witness that observed phenotype of a 
uh, increase in longevity. So it's important to have those contexts behind understanding that data too. Yeah. And I would say too, that if you're someone who's able to get to that, you probably aren't smoking. Yeah, you probably exactly. Are, exactly. You know, well, you probably are doing like to get to the top two and a half percent, you basically have to do everything that you possibly can. And you kind of have to be born with at least like average genetics. Yeah, that's assuming you know? that's assuming a perfect situation. So it's it's as you've pointed out, the people that are able to maintain that, they're you know they're doing so many other things to to take charge of their health. And even then, there's a lot of genetic components too. There is, and and I think you know, don't get me wrong, I'm a big proponent of of saunas, and like I just enjoy doing saunas, you know, and and but I, you know, if there is health benefits to it fantastic which i do think there are some but um you know i would kind of do it even if there wasn't just because i just like getting in the sauna well the thing is there's um, you know and sorry to interrupt you here there's something to be said yeah, about doing something that you enjoy even if there you know was no literature about the, the associations between saunas and reduced disease risks which there are very little relatively um if you enjoy something and it reduces your stress levels that's going to impact your health outcomes too yeah, yeah so it's like enjoying a specific exercises, you know, um, you know, those sorts of things that are relatively good on, on your state of mind. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And like, there has been, you know, times in my life where I've used maybe a little bit, you know, too much cannabis and, um, like <laughs> a right lot of now, people, like <laughs> a lot of people, like right now, like I, I only use, if I use anything in the day, it's only CBD. And then even at night now, if I use anything, it's just one-to-one. -one. Like that's it. Like I don't do any like high, you know, THC, but I genuinely feel like when I get out of the sauna, like I get a little bit of that, like high feel. Yeah. It feels you know? good. And, and it, it, it feels good. And then, you know, I'm, I'm not a huge on cold therapy. Like I, I don't mind it. Like the thing that I like with cold therapy is, um, there was a study that Huberman posted in 2022 that showed that you only need the temperature at 68 degrees Fahrenheit or 20 degrees Celsius to get some benefit. Now you have to do it for five minutes as opposed to say like um, 90 seconds or three minutes, maybe if it's like super cold. Um, and I'm certainly not dunking on like cold plunges. Like I agree that like there's nothing that like changes our physiology, like jumping into cold water. It's, it's, it's pretty crazy. But I do think that, um, you know, if you're not that type of person, and obviously a lot of people don't own, own uh, cold plunges, you can just get a relatively cool shower and get maybe not all the benefits, but like most, you know, it's kind of like a Tim Ferriss minimal effective dose style there. Yeah, you know? yeah no, and, and, and I'm not like a, an avid supporter of doing cold plunges either. I um, honestly, I'm, a, you know, for lack of a better word, I'm a little bitch when it comes to dealing with cold water. <laughs> Um, so I've even tried like cold showers, unless I'm like really, really warm or I came outside from doing a strenuous activity or some form of exercise. Uh, most often than not, I won't go under cold water. I enjoy warm a lot more. And of course there yeah. are some, yeah, I think most people would agree with that. Um, you live in Philly, so it's pretty cold there too. It's probably not quite as cold. Well, as, I'm, as I'm in, I'm in Durham, North Carolina right now, but I did, oh. I lived in Philly prior to that. And I lived in uh, Western Massachusetts prior to, to that, um, for my time. Yeah. So, it, you know, it, gets real cold up there too. But, you know, I grew up freezing my ass off, but you know, I've, I've grown to appreciate the warmth when I can, but you know, there are some health benefits to doing cold plunges. I just, I think people place a lot of, um, importance on things that, um, that realistically aren't so important in the long run regarding cold plunges. Yeah, I, I agree. And they can be expensive too. And you know, there's, there's a lot to it. They're kind of cumbersome. Like if you can just, the reason why I brought up the, the cold shower, why I kind of mentioned that is because it's, it can just be part of your day, you know? So, um, like I've mentioned this before too, like on, I have a pair of Luminette three glasses. I don't know if you've heard of them before, but they're mounted light glasses you can put on. I think they're amazing. I got them about a month ago. They're blue light blocking, right? Uh, no, so, so these would be the opposite. So they put blue light in your eyes, like, um, like directly in your eyes. So I use, I use those in the morning and there's legit PubMed like studies on it. And so for me, like I try to get the sun in the morning. I do think that makes a difference. It for does. Me. Yeah. I've, I've always thought this even before, like, you know, Huberman kind of made it, made it popular. Well, the thing but is the, with Huberman there, the, uh, 
the studies regarding circadian biology relating to light intake have been there for a long time, way before Huberman. My, my wife is actually um, in the circadian biology field. She does research. That's what her postdoc is in. So those studies have been out for a long time. I think actually it's really cool that uh, Andrew Huberman has, has brought those to light, lack of a, a pun there. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I think it's actually really cool that now people are starting to pay attention to those things, but realistically they've, those trends have been out for decades and, and I'm glad that people are starting to, to pay attention to those and try and emphasize, you know, being outside when they can and, and embracing natural sunlight. Cause you know, we've got all these fluorescent lights that, that can change our, our physiology in ways that we, you know, didn't realize before. Yeah. Well, you know, I won't go too far into the, into the light, um, uh, conversations sure. cause there's so much to kind of yeah. unpack. It's a there, whole different field my, of biology. It is. But what I was kind of getting at there is like when I, I just put the glasses on in the morning and then I go make my coffee, you know, and kind of, uh, get ready for the day. And it's doesn't take up any more of my time. Right. And then with the cold shower, like, I imagine you're going to get a shower when you get up anyway. So you don't have to do like the cold plunge and add to it, you know, so you're not like adding to your day. So that can kind of be helpful. But um, I know I'm kind of going over time here and there was, you know, one thing that I, that I really wanted to ask you about. So um, fasting is kind of like all the rage now. You've done some some posts on it. You know, some people think that it uh, induces, everyone says this word differently. Uh, Autophagy. 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 Look at that. We both just said it differently. <laughs> yeah. So there you go. And then, you know, you probably saw the big Dana White fast where, you know, he went 72 hours yeah. and people kind of jumped all over it. And, you know, I'm not dunking on Dana. I will say that, like, if anyone can go 72 hours without eating anything, that's pretty good discipline, man. Like, good for you. Like, that's that, that's pretty difficult, you know, to, to uh, do. But in terms of fasting and cancer, like, um, is there any data at all that says that if you, you know, fast, whether it's short term, whether it's intermittent fasting, long term or these, you know, 72 hours fast, is there any data at all that indicates that it would, that it can be helpful? Yeah. So most of the, the data surrounding fasting and cancer outcomes are, are largely in mouse models. Um, so right now there is, there's very weak evidence to suggest that fasting can actually be helpful for cancer patients. And again, most of those situations are, um, you know, fasting plus a chemotherapeutic or some form of immunotherapy or some form of therapeutic intervention. Um, so, you know, if I look at the totality of evidence, I can say right now there's, there's very weak evidence to suggest that fasting approaches would be helpful. But I don't want anyone out there to think that just because I've said that, that they should go fast. Um, weak evidence doesn't mean good evidence um, or conclusive evidence. So I think it's important to that that people have realistic expectations when it can come to that kind of stuff. Um, I think that it's promising, but we have to understand a lot more about how this will translate to actual uh, to human outcomes, um, especially as we acquire more human data. Okay. Yeah, the same could be said yeah. about ketogenic diets or anything like that. We actually know more about ketogenic diets do in regards to cancer patient outcomes than we do uh, fasting approaches. Um, but I would expect similar outcomes, you know, through the fasting literature. And again, it's probably only in the context of, of dietary fasting in combination with uh, some form of uh, therapeutic intervention. So not alone. I think alone could actually be damaging to cancer patient outcomes, especially as they develop into late stage of disease. Yeah. And, and I mean, fasting too, obviously, you know, when you're a cancer patient, weight loss is a concern. And so, you know, if you don't eat, that's obviously just going to, you know, add more problems. Yeah. Uh, can make things worse for that. sure. Yeah. Um, so obviously I have to ask you this question because uh, I'm a, uh, a cannabis, cannabis physician. I'm a family physician that prescribes cannabis. You're a, uh, a cancer IG page, number one IG page guy. So I have to ask you, is there, and I mean, I've never, ever made any of this claim. Of course, if someone has, you know, symptoms of cancer, it can be extremely helpful to treat like, you know, the nausea, yeah, and vomiting, palliative care. Uh, the, the insomnia, that kind of thing. But when people say cannabis and cancer, like, are like, what are your thoughts? Because I've never really seen any, like, you know, I've seen a couple case studies, you know, when, and case studies are difficult because, you know, it's only one particular person, um, unless you do a case series and then even then it's maybe only a few people. So is there any evidence at all that, you know, ingesting cannabis of any kind, a particular cannabinoid ratio can uh, reduce your risk of cancer? 
Um, yeah, so I did a post on this a while ago, actually, regarding cannabinoids. Um, there's some literature that suggests it's helpful for some cancers and some literature that suggests it's harmful for others. And there's actually some overlap. The ones that, you know, some, um, the ones that said that it was good for some types of cancers and reducing risks. Um, there's been other studies that, you know, counteract that evidence and say, okay, maybe it's actually not so helpful to those types of cancers. So it's conflicting evidence is the point that I'm getting at in terms of cannabinoids and um, impacts for um, cancer patients. And again, this is, this is in cancer patients. This isn't as a risk reduction strategy. For risk reduction, you know, I, I would say that there's probably very limited if anyone who takes THC or cannabinoids or some form of cannabinoid, there's gonna be very little um, risk reduction if you don't have cancer. Um, but I think there is something to say about stress relief. Um, I know a lot of people utilize THC um, to relieve stress. I just, I, I would hope that um, people wouldn't become so dependent on it where it can actually reduce their ability to interact with their environment. If you're high all the time, you're not gonna do a good job in general. So I also wouldn't want that to impact someone's ability to, to exercise or achieve an appropriate respiratory capacity. Um, in no way, shape or form do I ever condone smoking. Um, I understand people do it for stress relief. And, um, again, I think that, you know, we have a lot of literature suggests that, you know, smoking cigarette smoke is, is bad for you, but I, I wager in the next 10 to 20 years, we'll get similar data for, for smoking, um, for smoking marijuana as well, um, in terms of damaging the, uh, mucosal lining in the, in the esophagus and, and damaging lung tissue as well, or respiratory capacity. Yeah. I think, you know, if you're going to use cannabis, the best way and healthiest way is obviously to ingest yeah. it. And we've, we've know, actually and shown that clinically, right? So like, you know, that there's, there's substances like Marinol, which you've mentioned are used for uh, palliative care in, in terms of, you know, increasing appetite in cancer patients. Remember we, we spoke about weight loss in cancer patients being a, actually a pretty strong indicator of, of mortality. Um, and so one way we can get cancer patients to eat is by increasing their appetite through utilizing something like THC. Um, and, and Marinol is a, is a frequently prescribed drug to later stage cancer patients to help combat those, uh, those outcomes. It's called cachexia is the, the clinical term for, for muscle wasting. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. I mean, I, I appreciate, you know, your, um, your view on that because, you know, cannabis can be effective in, for cancer patients in certain context with regards to symptom management um we just don't know really anything too much about if it has any impact on prevention and then you know obviously like you said very very importantly don't smoke you know don't smoke tobacco and you know try your best not to smoke any cannabis either um do you have any thoughts on vaping like do you think that that's safer than smoking or do you feel like the data is still very too early to even really make a good informed opinion on it? I mean, there's relatively decent conclusive evidence to show that, you know, vaping is going to be similarly harmful to smoking. Um, again, it's just, you know, it's different compounds that are being um, heated and absorbed into your, your mucosa within your, your esophagus and your lungs. Um, but it doesn't mean that heating and absorbing those molecules is going to not have the same or similar effects to smoking marijuana or smoking um, tobacco. Okay. So yeah, their research is a little bit more aligned with vaping and cigarette smoke than it is right now with with inhaling marijuana. But I'd argue they're all in the same boat. Okay. So in general, you know, try to avoid smoking, try to avoid vaping and just try to ingest your cannabis is the safest way. It's the safest way if you're going to ingest is, uh, you know, like a brownie or, or gummy or some some form of you know, pill or an oil, which has no calories yeah, or sugar or an or oil. Yeah, that's true. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I also want to mention, I, I've tried THC before just for the viewers. Um, cause I'm sure that they're probably wondering. Um, and I, I, I like it sometimes it hits me really hard. Sometimes my body can't seem to, to understand how to respond to THC. So I either get really, really high and really, really hungry, or it doesn't hit me at all. And then I end up taking more and then I get really messed up. So I've, I've stayed away from it completely. Like, cause I just, I can't control it. One to ones, man. I'm telling you, it's, it's good. Equal parts THC and CBD or even two to one or four to one, like meaning like 
10 milligrams of CBD. Man, I don't care to experiment because it gives me so much anxiety when I do get high from THC. So maybe this is like a genetic thing, right? So maybe I'm just predisposed to anxiety when I take various compounds like that. But, you know, if people find a ratio that works for them and helps them function as a human being in modern world, uh, Godspeed, you know? Yeah. And um, just because I I got you and you said that you're okay to go a little bit over time, I'm just going to ask you one more question if that's cool. So um, with regards to alcohol, and I think that you've, you know, posted about this before, it seems to be basically like uh, a direct correlation between, you know, the more alcohol, you know, drinks you have, essentially your higher risk of cancer. And like in Canada, we had, you know, pretty lenient guidelines until recently where it was like, you know, two drinks, a day for uh, a man and then about nine drinks a week for a woman. So, you know, almost one and a half for a woman, um, which are pretty lenient guidelines, but it seems like, you know, the less, the better. Um, And, but when I say that again, like, you know, I'm not saying I'm never going to drink alcohol again. Like I'm, I'm willing to, you know, have a little bit of fun and maybe sacrifice a little bit, you know, just because, it's fun. Sure. You know, but, we all do it. Um, I'm not going to lie. Like I yeah. don't drink every once in a while. Yeah. So I, uh, but in terms of, of alcohol, you would say that essentially the less is better in terms of cancer prevention. Is that correct? Absolutely. So I think people need to think about this with, um, through the lenses of the fact that just like smoking cigarettes, you're inhaling a, a carcinogen. It's the same with, with alcohol you're inhaling or you're consuming just a different carcinogen. Yeah. So, um, you know, there's, there's plenty of literature out there. Um, the, the National Cancer Institute, at least in the United States, has, you know, monographs through the, the, their cancer research that, you know, display the, the level of carcinogenicity of, of things like cigarette smoke or even alcohol. Um, and these are, you know, heavily regarded as carcinogens you want to avoid. Um, so, yeah. So, again, it doesn't mean that I'm not someone who doesn't drink. I just try and minimize the alcohol intake as much as possible. I'll, I'll socially drink just like anybody, but, you know, instead of just getting completely blasted, I'll have, you know, one, two beers or, you know, just, I really, as, especially as I get older, I focus on having drinks that I, I'll like, not just, not drink just to get drunk, like really focusing on quality of the drink. So like, I'll get that one stupid expensive beer because I want to try it, you know, or, or that, but then that's the only drink that I have, you know? So I think people need to be realistic with, um, yeah, that, that's a good point though. And it's a good strategy to like reduce your drinking, like just try to enjoy, you know, the drink itself. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's, it's uh, a good crisp beer can, can really be refreshing, you know, tasty yeah. sometimes. And I know I said that was going to be my last question. Can I ask you one sure, more? Sure, of course. It's okay. Okay. Thank you so much, brother. I really appreciate it. Yeah, anytime, Mike. No problem. Man. Here. Um, I meant to ask this at the beginning when we were talking about, you know, cancer screening. So mammograms, you know, there's so much in, in the, you know, social media world or all over the place about, you know, don't get a mammogram because it's going to cause cancer and, and this kind of thing. Um, you know, can you kind of shed some light on that? Because it seems like, um, you know, the, I forget the, uh, even the actual metrics that's used in milli equivalents, but it's something like, you know, um, I, you can correct me, but like, you'd have to do like thousands of these just to, uh, to have an, the exposure that would, you know, potentially cause, cause cancer. Yeah. Um, you're talking about radiation. Remember, yeah. R- radiation. Cause I remember too, for, so for the, um, uh, the CT angiogram test, which is the best test to, to detect heart disease because it detects the, you know, calcified plaque and the non-calcified plaque. I remember Peter saying that like, you know, you do that. Yeah. It exposes you to radiation, but it's only 4% of what, you know, you you can have throughout the whole year so like 96 percent of your reserve is still there yeah so and they pay attention to that when you go and you get those preventative tests too like they they won't if you're if you're reaching that potential if they know that you've gotten these tests within the past year and you're you're about maxed out they're not going to give you that test because of those risks they have guidelines in place they're not supposed to give you an excess amount of radiation the same is true regarding my the company i work for regarding radiotherapies like we can't dose a certain person person um beyond what's considered toxic levels and be you know an ethical practice but um you know regarding mammograms i you know going back to this i think anybody online who says that mammograms are dangerous um 
you know, I, I don't want to be mean to those people, but they deserve some form of punishment for, for their statement because it's completely devoid of, of evidence. And it's, it's a very ignorant way to think about preventative strategies for cancer um, because they're not considering the, the very, very minuscule doses of radiation in, in, in relation to overall radiation that we're exposed to. If they want to just pinpoint that one thing to, to blame for actually putting people at risks, but they're not, they're not discussing the, you know, what happens if I don't get a mammogram regularly? You know, those people who don't get mammograms regularly that maybe have predispositions for something like breast cancer, um, you know, they're at greater risk just by not going. So I'd rather them go and have very minuscule risks of very small, small amounts of radiation than not go and, and get cancer, potentially something that can't be treated or challenging to treat. It seems like, you know, the risk benefit ratio is all in the favor of, you know, getting the mammogram. And like we said at the very beginning of the podcast, you know, if you, you want to reduce your risk of cancer, um, you know, the best way is to, you know, implement as many prevention, reduced risking uh, strategies as possible. And so, you know, taking out something that has a proven risk to benefit ratio just kind of seems silly. And, you know, also too, um, you're not going to be exposed to, you know, a serious amount of, of radiation. And I don't know if you can put a, a number on it, but like, it, it, is it something like 1% of what you would be, you know, uh, exposed to in a year? Is it even way less? Probably than even that? way less than that in terms of, uh, millicuries okay. or, or becquerels. And it depends on the units you want to use for, um, quantifying radioactive dose. Um, but it's, it's, negligible at best, less than a percent, I would argue, in most cases. Again, if they have a good machine, which most hospitals, you know, those things have to get tested. Um, I think on a like three monthly basis, like every three months they have to get examined. So if a machine isn't operating within um certain threshold, they have to either get a new machine or get somebody to fix it so that it is operating in thresholds. That's important to know. And, and probably what's even more important is what you said earlier that like they have guidelines. So like they'll know if you've been, you know, if you had a CT angiogram and then, you know, something else that, you know, exposed you to more and more stuff. And then all of a sudden you kind of used up all your units, you know, they're going to know and, and steer you away, which is, you know, I think very important for people to know. And also to kind of reassuring that that you know, is, is in place. Yeah. And the safety, you know? the safety guidelines, particularly, I think one thing that clinics do get right is the safety guidelines regarding radiation are stupidly strict. And that's a good thing. So I think that there's a level of trust that needs to be had in, in how clinics operate regarding um, radiation safety. We all have to go through it in our lab training, but when it comes to, you know, actually having these things that emit radiation in hospitals, the level of attention to detail regarding radiation safety is, is extremely rigorous in most, um, most hospitals. Well, that's very reassuring for, for people listening. So I appreciate you saying that. Um, that being said, thank you so much for going, you know, more than 20 minutes past, uh, than what we had planned for. I really do appreciate that. And thank you so much for sharing all the knowledge uh, that you have today. I, you know, I learned a lot and I imagine that everyone listening did too. So where can people find you online? Where can they learn more about you? Where can they contact you and, and, uh, anything else that you want to share? Yeah. So mostly people can contact me on my Instagram. That's at Dr. Uh, dot Joe Zondel. Um, people can find me there. I realistically only have an Instagram. I have a Patreon that I started recently. People can look there as well. Um, if they want to support some of my endeavors, again, that's just, you know, donations. People don't have to. Um, I, you know, strive on, on being a relatively free resource to people because I think there's a lot of paywalls nowadays. So again, people can just find me on Instagram. They can ask me questions there via DMs. I won't always be able to answer them, but, you know, depending on how good the question is, um, I'll go out of my way to answer, um, people's questions. Amazing. Well, thank you so much again. Thank you so much, everyone for listening. And as always, I'll be back again next week. Appreciate it.